All right, folks, welcome back. For those that don't know, this is me doing a revamp of an old 2014 video series I did by the same title, Market Maker Series. I did uh, 12 videos in that series, and, and I was long-winded in most of those installments. So with the backdrop of all of the supportive studies on this YouTube channel, uh, it's been my interest to revisit that series and kind of like polish it up a little bit. And with that perspective in mind, hopefully I'll be able to deliver something that's much more meaningful and impactful to your trading, especially for those that have been with me for a long time. Uh, newer students that I've acquired over the last six months or so uh, may be impressed by the level of insight that this series will bring them. But I also want to begin with something that is important to know. There's a lot of market maker buzzwords that are making the rounds on YouTube, on Instagram, all over social media, Facebook, Telegram, everywhere. And the bulk of what you're seeing regurgitated actually came from this series here, or it came from my 1996 lecture notes, which, again, many people have taken pieces of what I've taught over almost the last three decades and tried to come up with their own little interpretation. And all of them have been found wanting. It's my goal here to try to present this in a manner that is concise, succinct, and to the point as best as I possibly can, and not try to gloss over too much and make it of no use. So while I won't have 12 videos, I am going to go through that series and pull out everything and put them in the proper context, the proper order, so that way everything that should have been understood and more, because this is a revamp of it, hopefully will be delivered by me in these five videos. This first volume is Understanding the Macro. All right, before we get into the nuts and bolts of all this, who is the market maker? Now, obviously, I'm saying that with my tongue in cheek, <laughs> but who is it? Who is the market maker? While the central banks are the producer of currency prices and are the market maker, central banks establish and manage a country's currency price at all times, both autonomously and manually. Currency prices are 100% controlled and manipulated by central banks. Investment bank dealers, Goldman Sachs, UBS, Citi, or brokers are not market makers. Now, they're commonly calling themselves, I'm a market maker, I'm an ex-market maker at Goldman Sachs, I'm an ex-market maker at UBS, I'm an ex-market maker at... Credit Swiss, all, all these guys are dealers, okay? Or ladies, in deference to the women. They're not market makers, okay? If we're talking about the currency markets, Forex, the central bank is the market maker. Everybody deals and trades and exchanges on their product. Their product is the price of the commodity or currency. They make that price. Buyers and sellers do not make that price. We only exchange at the price feed that's given to us. Dealers and brokers do business with the price feed set and delivered by central banks. Dealers and or brokers do not set or control currency prices. Central banks are not following retail indicators or flawed retail logic. Examples being, they do not in 
the algorithms do not consider Wyckoff, Harmonic, Elliott Weave, VSA or volume spread analysis, supply and demand zones, etc. No matter what it is that you may subscribe to as a trader, none of that is considered when these central bank algorithms deliver price, reprice, or hold in consolidation. It's just the facts. Central banks employ high-tech algorithms to deliver currency price feeds, and they do not run on supply and demand. I'm going to repeat this one. Central banks employ high-tech algorithms to deliver currency price feeds, and they do not, 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 okay, and let me press it so many times, it's important you understand this, that supply and demand has no bearing on the delivery of currency prices, period. Now, with all that said, let's dive deep. Understanding the macro. Now, when you're considering market maker concepts, real market maker concepts, you have to start with quantitative analysis. Okay, now, quantitative analysis is something that's statistical. It's measurable. It's not subjective. It's not left for interpretation like looking at a trend. Is a trend still bullish or is it bearish? You ask 20 different traders on multiple different time frames, they're all going to come with, with a different interpretation of whether it's bullish or bearish. Okay, that's subjective. That's qualitative. Okay, we'll get into qualitative analysis, but for now, we have to start with quantitative analysis. And that means something that is measurable, it's statistical, and it's not up for interpretation. It's pretty much straightforward. When you're doing quantitative analysis, you're asking essentially the first question being, what should the market be experiencing at the present? Like right now, when you're sitting down in front of your charts, what are you expecting price to be experiencing in terms of bullish or bearish? Is the market bullish or bearish? You have to have a way of determining that. How do you get that information? What derives that answer or whether it's bullish or bearish? So where do you find that information? Well, the first is global interest rates. Now this address here is just an additional link, but if you go to www.global-rates.com, it'll take you through very simple prompts on the page. That link specifically though, you wanna bookmark that one. Okay, and whenever you do your quantitative analysis, you can refer to the global rates. And the other being commitment of traders. And you can find that on barchart.com. Now, these are just suggested websites that if you Google and you do some your own lead work, you may find that there are other websites out there that you're more inclined to use or warm up to uh, these are just simple generic websites that will provide the information for you for free you don't need to subscribe to anybody's service you don't need to be a part of any specific platform this information is 100 percent free it's just a click and research and that's it the global interest rates are the quote-unquote fundamental driver that sets the tone for long-term macro price movement. The commitment of traders shows you a visual representation of what smart money is doing and how they're positioned periodically. Now, by blending these two elements, it gives you a real measurable and quantitative perspective on what smart money is doing, or in this case, what market makers are interpreting price on a long-term basis. That's how you start with the question of what's bullish, what's bearish. Notice I'm not talking about trend lines. I'm not talking about moving averages. I'm not looking for any of those types of things. This is what interbank traders concern themselves with. This is what they're looking at. How do you plan your analysis? Well, by looking at these two specific 
points of interest, you're going to come up with a buy program or a sell program. Very simple. Now, what does that really mean, though? Well, let's go further. When you go to barchart.com, we're going to assume that we're going to be pulling up a currency, and we'll use Japanese yen here as an example. You're going to see that they have a select commodity tab. When you click that tab, the drop down menu will appear. You scroll down to currencies and you pick the currency that you're interested in studying. In this case, we're going to use Japanese yen. You click on that. Your browser will take you to this page here. What you're going to be looking for is every one of these particular lines aren't necessarily one that you're going to be picking the top. You're going to be looking for the one that has the highest open interest. So it's the line directly underneath this one. The top one is cash. You can't plot the commitment of traders data on a cash chart. You got to use a futures chart. So the highest open interest right now is the September contract for 2020. One, and you can see the open interest is 196,469 contracts. That means that's the open interest or available open interest that's in that particular contract month. After September's contract expires, because we're talking about futures here, it would roll over to December 2021, and the open interest would rise from 958 to whatever the highest open interest would be before it expires. And then once December 2021 expires, it would roll over to March 2022, where it only has six in the open interest slot. Now, that would only increase considerably after the December contract starts the midway point of its life cycle. When you have this page here, you would be clicking, obviously, on the second one, which is September 2021. Once that occurs, this is the page it would take you to. And look at the upper left-hand corner where it says Interactive Chart. You would click that link at this point here, and it would give you this chart. Once you're on this chart, you're going to go to the little tab that says Plus Study. When you click on that, you're going to see an option to put in an indicator. Okay. When I say that, understand that we're not looking at something like an RSI or a stochastic or a CCI. None of that stuff is useful. Okay. You don't need any of that, but the commitment of traders, you're going to type that out commitment of traders. And by the time you put in C O M, it'll offer that as the option, you just click on it. And then once you click on it, it'll open up this little window. You're going to click on the little eyeball next to small specs and that'll put a line through it and then you'll click the Add button. When you do that, you'll get the Commitment Traders graph applied to your chart. It'll post it on the bottom of the chart. You can toggle it to the top of the chart or leave it at the bottom. Historically, it's always been seen underneath price charts, but we'll get to that in a minute. The other link I gave you is global-rates.com, and once you go to that website and you click on interest rates and then, you know, the central bank's breakdown or summary of current interest rates page will open up. And this is basically what it looks like. Now, each one of these columns are active in the way that if you click on it, it'll sort it like a spreadsheet. Now, if you click on the country or region, it will put it in alphabetical order. If you click on current rate, it'll do it from high to low or low to high, vice versa. Or if you want to know which one's changing direction for going up or going down, you can toggle that and it'll list it by that way as well. Or you can do a search on how the rate was previously and when the last time that rate was changed at the central bank level. For now, the only thing I want you to focus on is toggling, clicking this, and then sorting them by high to low. Okay, so, or low to high, it doesn't make a difference. But you want it in a list that increases or decreases so that way you can find things rather quickly now there are some countries in here that i'm not interested in for instance the israeli interest rate i'm not interested in trading that i'm not interested in the polish interest rate i'm not interested in the czech interest rate 
for the Hungarian interest rate. What I'm looking for is like the majors, like the Swiss franc, the Japanese yen, European interest rate from the ECB, British pound for Great Britain, obviously the Fed from the United States, Canada's bank rate, New Zealand's bank rate. So it's basically the majors. All right. So Australia is another one in here. So Australian dollar. So you have all the majors in here and what their respective current interest rate is. Now, when you're looking at the interest rates, you want to toggle them, obviously, however you want to sort them, you want to sort them by specific country. You can click on this and it'll toggle all of the countries by alphabetical order. So that way you can find the majors that are coupled with the dollar or a cross of your choice quicker that way and then visually go right over to where the interest rate is at the moment. Now I'm going to talk to you about interest rate differentials. What is an interest rate differential? Well, it's the difference, obviously, between one country's interest rate versus another. And why is that important? Well, the importance is that on a central bank level and an interbank level, large flows seek yield. And that means that they're always looking for a rate of return. Now, would you rather be in a country that has an interest rate of 5% or would you rather be in a country that has an interest rate of 2%? In other words, you have the ability to make 5% or 2%. Which one would you put your money in? Well, hopefully you would be considering the 5%. Well, large flows and, and large interest in yield and speculation they think the same way. So how do you get the information on which country has the highest yield? This list right here. And obviously, as a foreign exchange trader that you're aspiring to be, or maybe you are and you're just not finding consistency, this will give you the foundation to finding real markets that are really engineered to go a particular direction. But you have to look for something specific, and that's the differential. So it's not enough to simply look for a high-yielding interest rate country. You need to find a high interest rate yielding country's currency and couple it with a weak currency. For example, if you look at Japan right here, okay, the Japanese interest rate for the Central Bank of Japan its interest rate is negative 0 0.10. Now in this list, if we found a currency that has a high yielding interest rate relative to that negative 0 0.10 from Japan, we'll look at the Fed's current interest rate at 0.25%. So there's a differential between the two. The higher interest rate is with the Fed or the American dollar versus the Japanese yen meaning the differential is positive for dollar and negative for yen. Now, since we have that fundamental backdrop on the interest rate front, we know now we can go into the commitment of traders chart and we're looking at the dollar index. Now, typically, I don't really like to put the commitment of traders graph on the dollar index. And the reason why is because many times it could look like this, where it doesn't really give you a whole lot of information in this format. Now, there's a way to obviously change this and draw more information from it, but majority of the time it looks like this and it won't give you the movement above the zero basis line. Now, the zero basis line, what we're interested in is the red line. That's the commercials. The commercials, we'll just call them the central banks. Okay. When they go above the zero line, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a buy. And just because they're below the zero basis line doesn't mean that the dollar index is going to go down. What we're looking for is a combination of interest rate differential and 
the highest long position net long or lowest net short position held by the commercials. Now, since we're looking at the dollar index and we're thinking in terms of it being a higher interest rate, which is, you know, it's really not that high of an interest rate, it's only a quarter percent, but in relationship and contrast to the rate of the Bank of Japan being negative point one zero, dollar has the better interest rate. So what we're looking for is a time when the dollar has the commercials being above the zero line. We see that here in the latter portions of 2020. In December into January, notice that the red line is higher than it's ever been in the past few years. So they're net long here, higher than they have been in recent time at this moment in the chart. Now this by itself is bullish only if we see the opposite with the Japanese yen. Because remember what we're doing is we're matching up a strong fundamental interest rate differential against a weak interest rate differential, that being dollar versus yen. So if we take a look at the yen, you can see as we crossing from December into January 2021, the commercials have never been this net short. In other words, they're thinking that it's overbought and it's likely to go down at this point right there. So any time in the past in this chart, they've never been as bearish or below this zero line as they were right here. And by itself, it doesn't mean anything. You want to see a break in market structure. And if you look at this swing low right there, you see a low with a higher low to the left and a higher low to the right. Many of you to understand market structure would be looking at this low being broken, and that's the market structure break for you. That's not what it is for me. This is a swing low, the highest of all these candles up here until it finally broke down. This being broken there is a market structure shift or break for me. Once this occurs, then all of the understanding that this outlined for you where it's bearish for yen, bullish for dollar, and the interest rate differential will now kick in. Then the algorithms will start to reprice yen lower and dollar higher or consolidate dollar. Presently, we've been seeing dollar consolidated, but yen has been allowed to reprice lower. So how does that translate to a Forex chart? Well, here we have the dollar yen because when we're pairing the weaker against the stronger using these differentials, the two currencies are dollar and yen. So the pair name is dollar yen, and that's what we're employing here for the charting purposes. The chart is plotted on the basis of US dollars versus Japanese yen, and we're using the stronger Fed rate versus the weaker Japanese rate. So this translates into expectations that it would be bullish for this chart because dollar should be going up while yen drops. And it would be basically bearish yen. Thus, dollar yen should be expected to rally higher. And we obviously see that here. Here's December crossing into January. Short term high, broken. So then we have a break in market structure. Now the algorithm will reprice dollar higher against yen. And that's what you see here. Now, this is not a small move, folks. This is pretty significant. But this in itself is the basis to understanding how to find markets that should be moving in one direction. But you're doing it in a way that is done like an interbank trader. It's not some willy-nilly guy that puts TDI indicators on his chart calling all kinds of moving averages and chasing price. We're looking for real measurable and quantitative means of determining what these markets are going to do. It's not hypothetical. It's not subjective. It's very specific things that you're looking for. And you go in looking for these types of moves to be the foundation to majority of your trades. Now, if you trade in this direction, and you're buying, you can be a short-term trader being a buyer, you can be a day trader, you can be a scalper, 
You can be a position trader, swing trader. Every facet of trading disciplines can be employed by being bullish on dollar yen. Okay, now we're going to be looking at the interest rate differential in the CAD yen. This is going to be a case study for it. So we're going to be looking again at the Japanese yen, which is a weak interest rate, negative 0 0.10. And the Canadian dollar has a interest rate the same of what we referred to in the dollar index. It has the same rate. So right away, you should know that it should be bullish Canadian dollar bearish Japanese yen. But we have to go behind the scenes and go do a quantitative analysis on what the actual positions are by the smart money. Because the commitment traders gives us a graphic depiction of their real trading, of their real positions. It's not just, well, this should be bullish or this should be bearish. Okay, that's the precursor. The interest rate differential is the precursor. It doesn't mean just because one interest rate is higher than the other that the chart's going to be, any time you sit down in front of it, it's a good buy or a good sell relative to that differential. You need to know that that is just the fundamental backdrop or underpinnings in the marketplace. Then you have to wait for smart money to position themselves. Then once that's there, the algorithm will reprice. All right, we're looking at the Canadian dollar futures market. And this is the September 2021 contract on barchart.com. And this is the symbol you would use to see it. Okay. And plotting the commitment of traders. Now, if you recall back on the globalrates.com or global-rates.com website, when we were looking at Canadian dollar, you probably didn't notice it in I didn't mention it, I apologize, but if you go back to that list or rewind the video, rewatch it or whatever, uh, you'll see that in March of 2020, it showed that it dropped about half a percent from 0.75% down to 0.25%. So it's a quarter percent from three quarters of a percent. So the interest rate actually dropped a half percent in March of 2020. Just from looking at it from face value, some would say, oh, that's not good because the interest rates are dropping. It doesn't make a difference here because what we're looking at is the differential. 0.25 is still better than negative 0.10. So when we look at March here, this deep dive down in price, it happens around the same time that the interest rate announcement comes out. And even though the interest rate dropped a half a percent, it's still a positive interest rate versus a negative interest rate that's seen in Japan. So right in here, when price is consolidating, look what's occurring here. We have a big buildup of net long positions by the commercials. They're above the zero line, so they're bullish. Okay, so they're bullish at the time when the interest rate differential is positive for Canadian, negative for yen. Later on, as we get into the end of 2020, we move from bullish to negative below the zero level. This swing down doesn't change it being bullish. It just means that we're in a strong trend and these relative equal highs up here, and I know some of you that are new think that this isn't equal, it's relative. Okay, it's, we look for this to be taken out, okay? In other words, there's a lot of buy stops up there. Just like this is relative equal highs, but it didn't take long for it to get below, above that there. But from a long-term perspective, and this is what we're focusing on, this high here should be challenged, and we've seen it here. Now, I know some of you may be new to me, and this might seem like, well, this is obvious to talk about it in hindsight, but I promise you, this stuff repeats all the time, every three months, every six months, every nine months, every year, okay? It, it works all the time. But we're in a year that followed a really weird year because of all the illness-related things, and I'm not going to say anything more than that. But even with that, 
this information still ferrets out moves. So we have a net long position here that's bullish at a time when the interest rate has dropped. So since 2016, the negative rate on Japan hasn't been changed. So we had a change in the interest rate on the loonie or the Canadian dollar. So that rate dropped a half percent, but still remained a positive rate in contrast to what Japan's rate is negative 0 0.10. So we have the real positioning of the smart money being bullish at a time after the interest rate announcement. And even with this drop down below the zero line here, all that indicates is we're in a strong trend and now they're just hedging into until we get to this really extreme net short position here where that's where the market tops out after it runs this high and it runs the end of its seasonal tendency. And I will counsel you to go back through recent videos. And again, the time of this recording is July 26th, 2021. So in recent weeks or within a month or so, uh, I taught a lesson on seasonal tendencies and actually talk about Canadian dollar and how the seasonal tendency for Canadian dollar is specific around a time of year. And if you look at what we see here, it's delivered exactly like I outlined even in that video there. But that's for another time, another discussion. Let's move over to the Japanese yen again. We've already seen the chart, but we're referring to it again. So we're bearish here and just crossing over doesn't change it from being bearish to bullish. It just means that the trend is strong and now they're hedging in as it's dropping down. They're buying into those lower lows because they sold short up here and to get out of a short, how you have to get out of it, you have to buy it back. And that's all we're seeing here is the smart money is buying back their heavy net short positions from up here. So let's take a look at what that translates to in terms of a Forex chart. So the interest rate differential on CAD yen is seen here. So in the November and December time period, you can see a market structure break here, comes back down in, starts to rally up and follows that underlyingly bullish Canadian dollar, bearish Japanese yen, and the market rallies up and has a significant price run of over 1200 points. So that's a significant run in price. So you can be, again, in any of this run up here, you could be a day trader, you can be a short term trader, you can be a swing trader, a position trader, but these large moves are what the interbank traders from the central bank level, okay? There will be people that say central banks don't trade. No, they employ people to trade for them. They speculate. They're trying to make money in every avenue. Okay, they have their tentacles in everything. Okay, so it's not a stretch of the imagination to if they're going to control price and they basically run the, the whole store, who's going to police them? No one. There's never been an audit on any central bank. You're never going to tell them they can or can't do something. It's their game. It's their role. It's their casino. And they can do whatever they want. And if they control it, they have the inside edge. They have the advantage. Okay? So you can be mad. You can fold your arms and hiss and say this is unfair. Or you can say, well, this is how they do it. And I'm going to operate like this. This is the closest that you're going to get to it. And it works. It's extremely powerful information. The insight that it gives you really puts you on the right side of the marketplace. And it's not just a one day bias. It's long term. Now, I don't get in positions and hold them from a low like in November uh, 2020 all the way up to a high of June. I don't trade that way. And the reason why is I don't have the patience to do that because I'm like a dog chasing cars. I can see a one minute chart, a five minute chart, a 15 minute chart, a one hour chart, and see dozens of trades all week long. And if I have a trade on like this, my personality is short term 
specialized in doing in and out surgical strikes that because I can change my mind a lot. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying I have matched my personal personality <laughs> with a mode of trading that fits and suits me, which is crucial for your trading. But don't let that be an invitation for you to mimic me because some of you may be excellent long-term position traders that you're very committed to an idea and it takes a lot for you to change your mind. That's the personality characteristic that's meant for long-term position trading. But if you don't have those characteristics and you're trying to do it, it's like, it's very miserable because you're, you're going to feel like you can't, you can't do it. Okay? You're going to be wanting to change your mind all the time. Every little fluctuation is going to make you want to change your mind to get out of the trade. And a swing trader has a little bit less patience than a position trader, but more patience than a short-term trader, day trader, or scalper. And some of you have those characteristics and others are thinking, well, you know, I like to be in for a week, maybe three or four days and then get out. That's short-term trader. If you have less patience than that, you're probably a day trader at heart. And the way you would use this information is from the crossover here when we had a market structure break and it starts to rally again. Every bullish day in here is a day where you're trying to capture intraday price moves, a day trade. And down days may be a day that you take a loss or you sit on your hands and wait for a new setup. And scalping, you would put more on your trades that were in the bullish side of things and trade a whole lot less leverage when you're shorting in a move that's fundamentally driven like this. I'm not saying you can't make money shorting in moves that run up like this, but my question is, is why would you want to do that when everything is predisposed to go higher? Okay, so hopefully this first installment has got your gears turning and it gives you a little bit of clarity about the mystery that makes these markets move around. Uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what makes these things gyrate and go to where they want to eventually get to in volume two. Until then, be safe.